grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Once again, we are treated to a torrent of words from Mark that are short and sweet and run very quickly. And we get surface impressions uh, from what is going on. Um, we have just moved from the scene where Jesus is called the disciples by the uh, side of the Lake of Galilee. Uh, they have moved up into Capernaum. Uh, obviously that is not the Sabbath. And now we are at the Sabbath and Jesus is in the synagogue uh, with the congregation. And there are a lot of unanswered questions, even as we want, come into the scene. Uh, how did Jesus get invited to speak or preach or teach? Surely the rabbi of Capernaum must have had some say in that. What is it that Jesus is saying? As we go through this little vignette, nothing is said about the content of what Jesus has said. And yet, uh, right away, we get a reaction from those who are worshiping uh, that there is amazement uh, that Jesus has this, this authority in Greek, ousios, substance uh, to character. There, there is something about him and something about his message that reaches them deeper than those of the scribes. And this is not to diss the scribes. The scribes were those people uh, who were sort of the spiritual descendants of Ezra after the end of the exile, who came home with the texts. And their job was to know the texts intimately, inside out. And when people had a question about how sacred scripture uh, impacts daily life, they were supposed to be able to give an answer. These are the people that are the scribes in Jesus' day. And yet the testimony of those who are in the synagogue at Capernaum uh, seems to indicate that Jesus goes beyond what the scribes can offer. The scribes are very much alive and well in our day. If you uh, come into my office and look at uh, some of the library that is there, I probably have about 150 commentaries, contemporary commentaries on scripture each on a particular book of the Bible. Now, we only have 66 books in our version of the Bible, so that can tell you about how many commentaries there are. I have five contemporary commentaries on Mark alone, all written by well-respected scholars. And if you look at the rest of my library uh, and include sort of the historical um, documents that I have, I have commentaries also from the early church, the medieval church, and the Reformation church. So that is hundreds of commentaries. And I find them very, very useful in approaching a text and helping me get a little bit deeper into a text and find out and maybe uh, encounter things I haven't thought about or made connections I haven't yet uh, realized. But here's the truth. When push comes to shove and I sit down and I begin to put together my notes to write a sermon, all that sort of surface stuff that the commentaries have given I have to put that away and I have to make some decisions about the text myself because it is one thing to know what scripture says and the commentaries are very, very good at sort of elucidating what scripture says. It is quite another thing to tell people what scripture means. And I have a feeling that in this scene in Capernaum, we have run across Jesus crossing that line from going from what scripture says, what the scribes are able to tell the people to what scripture means. And yet, there isn't really a clue within the text about what Jesus says. And, and I'm curious, how do we go deeper? This text is enticing, it's raising my curiosity. What is it that Jesus said? After all, we have, on the one hand, the reaction of those who are amazed at what Jesus said. And then on the other hand, we have the reaction of one person who is uh, designated by the text as being uh, under the influence of an unclean spirit. And he cries out, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of Israel. And that gives us a little bit of a clue that we can sort of step back a bit. And if we look at where uh, the first part of Mark, uh, of chapter one, has gone so far, we can see that Mark has a crescendo of testimony about Jesus that builds from the very beginning. First line of the gospel, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark puts no bones about 
who Jesus is right in the first line of the, of the gospel. And as we go from story to story, we see how John the Baptist testifies about the Messiah, how when Jesus is baptized, the heavenly voice says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. We go off to the desert for temptation. And Mark never tells us a word about what the temptations were that Jesus experienced. But he spends much more time telling us about how the angels ministered to him after the ordeal was over. Again, the angels kind of testify to who he is. And here we are at Capernaum. The congregation is amazed and testifies that his erudition, his understanding, his words go far beyond the scribes. And in this man who is under the influence of an unclean spirit, we get the testimony perhaps even of the demonic realm. And so all of the universe in these few short verses testify to who Jesus is. And yet at the same time, I think that that's wonderful to know but still it does not answer my curiosity. What is it that Jesus said? And if we go a little bit deeper in the text and perhaps go and look at what the man who's under the influence of an unclean spirit said more completely, we might get a little bit more of a clue. He says in a very pointed accusation to Jesus, have you come to destroy us? And the, the, the majority strain of the history of interpretation sort of looks at this man under the influence of an unclean spirit and says, well, you know, it's the influence of the unclean spirit that is speaking through this person. And uh, really the question is from the demons and the demons are kind of wanting to know from Jesus what he's going to do with them. Is he going to end their dominion? Have you come to destroy us? Well, that may be uh, a valid interpretation, and it's useful to know, but it really fits back into that one question of who Jesus is, not what is Jesus about. But I think if you ask that question again that the man asks, have you come to destroy us? And perhaps ask it from the point of view of a person who is listening to what Jesus is saying in the synagogue and getting it and getting the implications of it and maybe not just sort of the influence of the unclean spirit prompting him but his own humanity and common sense saying have you come to destroy us that raises a whole different question we are not used to thinking about the words of jesus in highly critical ways because we believe Jesus to be our Lord and Savior, and because we are disciples of Jesus, we, we tend to take the words of Jesus at face value and really don't look behind them. And again, I'm curious, what on earth was it that Jesus said in that synagogue that evoked the response of fear on the part of one person who was there? Well, Mark, as I said, does not give us any content on what Jesus said that day. But if you go a little bit earlier in the text, Mark does give us a summary of the gospel that Jesus is preaching in Galilee. And I would suspect because Mark is very economical in his words, he has already said what Jesus is preaching is in that summary. And there's no reason to believe that what he said at Capernaum was any different from that summary. And it's really four lines that form two couplets. It's, it's a pair of lines each. And the first couplet goes, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is coming towards us. And in Greek, the time is fulfilled. Uh, that, that word in Greek is kairos. And really it refers to a very different kind of way of marking time from the chronology that we use in terms of our watches and our calendars and, and marking the seconds and the minutes and the hours. This is saying that a new era is upon us. And, and saying that the kingdom of God is coming, what Jesus is saying is that God's era is coming upon us and God's kingdom of kinship where people are related to each other and care for each other is coming. And that, when you put into the context of the kind of situation people were living in in those times, was a very provocative, if not insurrectional, statement. After all, they were living under the thumb of the Romans and their local enablers. 
and everything was geared towards oppression and exploitation for Jesus to be preaching that kind of liberation for that kind of overturning from empire to God's kingdom was a radical thing. Bear in mind that the Romans leveling the town of Sepphoris, which was the capital of Galilee in 4 BC, was not very far away in terms of distance from Capernaum, nor in terms of memory. And when the Romans raised that city, they sent marauding bands of cohorts out to kill people who were out in the countryside. In the testimony of the Romans in their own writings, we have it. They wrote, we wanted to make such an example in Galilee that it would take two generations for them to think about rebellion again. Two generations, we're only one generation away from that. That pain is very real. And outside of Capernaum is a garrison. It's not a Roman garrison. It's actually a garrison for Herod's troops who are mercenaries. And they were there uh, to make sure that Herod got his cut from uh, the fishing enterprises, otherwise known as taxes. And everyone in town knew that those mercenaries were not Jewish. Those, those mercenaries had no love and no kinship for anybody in Capernaum. And they knew that it wouldn't take very much at all for them to turn their swords on them. And so when you hear the content of what Mark is saying Jesus is preaching is, the person in the synagogue who says, have you come to destroy us? I think is really beginning to get underneath what the words of Jesus are. And then there's the second half of what Mark reports as Jesus preaching. And it goes, repent, just one word, one line, and then believe the good news. And repent, we often get uh, misconstrued. We think, well, repent means asking God uh, for forgiveness and saying you're sorry about something and kind of moving on. That is not what this word means. The word in Greek is metanoite, and it is a word that comes out of classical Greek. And it has a military connotation. It's actually a military command. It is the command that a commander gives to a troop of hoplites on the march about to engage the enemy. They're marching down the road. The commander says, metanoite. And this is what is supposed to happen. The hoplites immediately put on their helmets, bring their shields and spears forward, turn, close ranks, and advance on the enemy, all in one movement. That is the command, metanoite. In religious and philosophical thinking, that military command gets transferred into uh, theological language. And when it's used in a, in a religious context, it means put on the mind of God as a hoplite would put on a helmet. Turn your life from the path that you are on to follow the path of God and close ranks with your disciples as you advance on that path. It is a radical call of a change of direction and a radical call of action. It's not just a passive reception of, oh, these are nice words that Jesus is saying. These are words that have import, that have ethical meaning, that change the direction of a life. Beginning to understand maybe the uh, person who said to Jesus, have you come to destroy us? Actually said something in brutal, frank honesty. And as you know, the gospel really leads towards living a compassionate life, even though in this case there is a military metaphor being used. The intent is to move us to live as passionately compassionate people. And here's the rub of that. If you are serious about living that kind of life, inevitably your compassion will rub up against authority. And you will have to make a choice about how you live your life. I remember several years ago, I was part of a group that went down south of Tucson into the desert to uh, chart out uh, where we could put water in, uh, for a humanitarian effort for those who are walking through the desert 
so they would not die of thirst. Uh, back at that time, uh, the number of people crossing the border uh, in the desert and dying because they uh, ran out of water was, was epidemic. Uh, and uh, within our first five minutes of leaving the main road between Nogales and Tucson, uh, heading into the desert. We ran across a man who was sitting in a dry stream bread in, in an arroyo, uh, obviously uh, out of it, uh, very dehydrated. Uh, when we uh, talked to him, uh, he was uh, largely incoherent. We asked him if, we w if he wanted us to call uh, the border patrol to have him picked up, and he said, yes, yes. He knew he wasn't gonna go any further. We called the border patrol and then uh, started rehydrating him and getting some electrolytes into him to, to bring him a little bit back up to speed. I was amazed at how fast border patrol arrived on the scene, but not really, I mean, thinking about it, we were really right next to a main road. And that scene could have unfolded in a number of different ways. Uh, the way it actually did unfold was they arrived, they saw that we were uh, rehydrating him and allowed us to do that. And uh, when he was able to uh, get on his feet, uh, they helped him in the back of the truck and uh, took him away. But I think that scene could have unfolded in a very different way. What if they had arrived and decided to exercise their right and authority to arrest the man immediately as we were still administering humanitarian aid? I do not know what would happen. All I can imagine is that the outcome wouldn't have been good for anybody as I would have to struggle with my mandate to give drink to the thirsty in the midst of someone dying of thirst and being arrested. What would that confrontation with authority look like? I don't know. And in the back of my mind, I hear this man in Capernaum hearing what Jesus says. And if Mark's summary of the gospel is what Jesus preached, asking the honest question, have you come to destroy us? The gospel that Jesus preached was challenging. It was risky. And I think at the end of this chapter or, or the, the end of this little story. Mark presents us with three ways that we can respond. We can respond like the rest of the congregation in Capernaum and say, oh, wonderful words. This is great stuff. Now, Jesus is fantastic, goes way beyond where the scribes, this brings my soul to a brand new place. But let me tell you, the admiration that the people in Capernaum expressed about Jesus is not the same as living faithfully and following Jesus. We can react as the way of the man who has the unclean spirit and ask the honest questions and realize, I think truly, the challenge and the risk of the gospel and say, you know, I think I'm gonna accommodate the gospel to make it a little bit more safe for me to live and go on that way? Or there is the third way that is in the previous story with the disciples at the lake shore, where Jesus says, come follow me. And they drop their nets. And no, they don't fully realize all the risk and all the challenge. They do not see how the road is going to fully unfold before them. But they trust, they believe the good news. And in their believing the good news and following Jesus, they realize both the cost and the joy of discipleship. And so I think in this little vignette, Mark is asking us, how are you going to receive the gospel? How are you going to follow Jesus?